This session is called in uh, Shaista Sirajuddin in conversation with Vikram Seth. Uh, I just want to tell you very quickly that if you would like copies of Vikram Seth's books signed by Mr. Vikram Seth, we have uh, made it arrangements for this uh, signing to be done where the book fair is being held. Uh, so uh, that is where Mr. Vikram Seth will go after this session. So please, if you could move to the book fair area to get your copies signed. Uh, please don't get them signed here because uh, the next session will begin here after that. This session will run for an hour and it will include question and answer session at the end. Salikum. This session is called Shaisa Sirajuddin in conversation with Vikram Seth. Professor Shaisa Sirajuddin is an English literature scholar who has taught generations of literature lovers. She has her, a degree from New Hall, Cambridge, and she has done research at Somerville College, Oxford. And she is a former dean of arts and humanities of Punjab University who has taught English literature for decades. Virtually got these mics in our mouths now. Let's not put our feet in our mouths as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is it's quite odd for me. Um, you still can't hear. You can. Okay. This, um, yes, those should be. Put AC Yeah. <laughs> Acha, I encourage everyone to uh, use their mobile phones during this talk. <laughs> I mean, if I get an urgent call, uh, look, I'll turn it off. Uh, menu, contacts, settings, profiles. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, if it rings, I guess I have license. Vikram Seth is known to many, many readers in Pakistan um, for this very huge book that he wrote many years ago called Suitable Boy, which you... <laughs> right. um, it's a great pleasure to have him here so that he can talk to us about the other work that he has done. Um, people have been saying to me earlier that I'm going to be grilling him. That is far from the case. Um, he is in every sense a remarkable and truly creative man and his work has great diversity. He's very versatile, which is a word that as a scholar I do not like to use because it can suggest that he's a jack of all trades and master of none, which is again far from the case. Um, I'd like him to today talk us through, if that is to his liking, uh, with his work beginning with the, the, the latest work, which is The Rivered Earth, and then work backwards to his early work, which includes poetry, which inclu includes uh, an early libretto, which includes a travel book uh, from <clears throat> in which he's traveling through Sinkiang and Tibet, and of course, an equal music, which uh, people are actually perhaps fonder of, perhaps fewer people have read uh, that very beautiful, eloquent and poised novel, and of course Golden, uh, Golden Gate. So I, I won't take any more time enumerating 
uh, all the things that he's done and how wonderfully he's done them and then now ask him to please uh, talk to us about his work. Um, thanks very much Esther, for this very uh, generous introduction. Um, a couple of housekeeping things first. If at any stage, I'm not used to being so close to a mic, if at any stage you can't hear me at the back, stand up and shout. It won't be at all embarrassing, just tell me because there's no point in speaking if you can't hear us, right? The second thing is, um, after we've spoken, perhaps we could ask the audience if they want to ask any yes, questions. Yes, certainly, yes, be there right? will be que the, uh, an, a question yeah, and answer session. session. Um, uh, as far as my most recent book, uh, you want me to take it backwards, yes, do you? Please. <laughs> yes, please. Is there any particular reason, Shaisa, for this? Well, I think it's so yeah, difficult keep... to actually start with where you started from and then yeah. move on to your latest work. But Fine. I think that perhaps going backwards okay. is good. It's like a yeah. CV. You start with what you did last and then where you started from. Good. I mean, it's quite interesting. I've never done this before and it'll, it'll probably do two things. The first is it'll uh, uh, intrigue me, this sort of backwards progression. But the other thing is that um, as I move backwards towards the, the, younger, the young man whom I was and whom I can hardly remember, uh, my, my answers or my description of the process will become vaguer and, and vaguer. So it won't be building up to a climax, it'll be building down to a bathos in some sense. But I'll try to return at the end to the river dearth, maybe to read one or two poems from it at the very end. Um, well, this book, uh, The Rivered Earth, came about partly as a result of my publisher visiting my house after I had promised to write a sequel to A Suitable Boy and a few other books of poems. I wasn't making very much progress. In fact, I still am not making too much progress with the sequel. Uh, part of the fault of that is that I am tempted by all these things like Kolkata and Karachi and so on, and, and I'm traveling a bit. But as a kind of interim measure, he wanted me to have something in hand, something that included prose and poetry if possible. And looking through my papers, he found these four libretti. Now, what is a libretto? A libretto just means small book. And it's the text of a musical work. That's all it really means. In the old days, I guess, uh, when you were listening to an opera, you couldn't make out what on earth they were saying on stage, so you looked down and read your libretto or your little book. Now, these four libretti um, came about because some festivals in England, which had musical aspects and literary aspects and so on, asked me and a particular composer, Alec Roth, to undertake a four-year project, uh, which is uh, to create a work of music each year with words in it, so the first one I set in China, um, some translations uh, of works that I'd already done. The second was set in, in Europe, in England, in fact in the house in which when I'm in England, I, 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 at that time I lived. Um, the third was set in India, or not just in India, you could call it the subcontinent, with various sacred and secular texts relating to different parts of our life. And the fourth one was an interesting one in the respect that it didn't go to another geography, but rather took the elements of these other three cultures, Europe, China, and the Indian subcontinent. It was called Seven Elements. Now, why seven? You might just say, you know, water, fire, earth, and air are the elements. But in, the, in our philosophical system, we also have the fifth one, Akash, or... Quintessence. Yeah, the quintessence, the fifth essence. Um, and the Chinese have earth, water, let's see, earth, metal, wood, fire, and water as their five elements. So they, all together they became seven, and I wrote a poem for each of these, and they were set to music. And um, although on the whole, my collaborator, the composer, was not uh, particularly displeased with what I had written, in this case, he rejected one of the poems. He simply said, I, it's fine as a poem, but I really can't make any music out of it. So go back and work again. And so that was the poem called Fire, uh, of which now two versions exist. One I simply um, wrote, um, uh, and the other which was set to music. In addition, there are some pieces of calligraphy in the book, 
Um, it's a slim book. Uh, I suspect the reason they asked me to do the calligraphy was because people would feel that they were getting their money's worth in terms of the number of pages. Uh, people expect me to write fat books. And when they got something as slim as, uh, uh, as this, the river death, they might feel rather short-changed. Um, I can see their point of view. But I myself, I'm not so keen on fat books. And I didn't expect to be writing uh, um, um, books that are, uh, you know, that are difficult, that are sort of an exercise in... Uh, yes, that's a book of poems. Though. I mean, that's, all, that's, that's six books in one. That's all my collected poems put together um, 14 years ago. Um, so what is the, the previous book I, I wrote? It was Two Lives, wasn't it? Two Lives, Before this. which was um, another fat book. Which was a fat book. But then um, that was a book of... Uh, It's a bit boring, actually, for me to just uh, be spouting on. Ask me a, a, a trenchant question or two, Shasta. Um, I'm interested, and I, you'll have to share my interest because I'm here and you're a captive audience. <laughs> I'm interested in Vikram Seth's poetry. A lot of people read fiction. Some people read a lot of fiction in Pakistan. Poetry is not read enough, and he is a poet. Um, I'd like to talk to you sure. about the way that you use rhyme okay. and meter because that is really very, very distinctive to my mind about uh -huh. your work. A lot of people don't use rhyme and meter in the way in which you do right. for all manner of purposes, comic, ironic, serious. Hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about that and why sure. you use a particular kind of okay. writing well, style? Just pass my book over if you don't mind. Thanks. Um, um, well, maybe, uh, is, there, is there a particular poem or something that you'd... Well, you'd, 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 okay. Um, Actually, I'd like you to read from the Aryan and the Dolphin. Okay. Which is the one where he talks about that feast of fish. Okay, okay. This is, a, uh, this is part of another, um, an opera which uh, I wrote the text for, another libretto. Agi Jagli. Agi Jagli? Oh, right. There's, at one point, Orion is made to uh, jump overboard into the sea by the, by the pirates who have um, who've, um, um, captured him and threatened him with death. Um, and he's taken up by a dolphin and the dolphins are playing with each other. Now, at a certain point, Alec, who was my collaborator, said, what I want from you is a kind of patter song, a song uh, which has a lot of rhyme and rhythm and meter, and which shows these fish uh, catching, I don't know, other fish and eating them on, uh, in the sea. So here was the poem. It's a very lighthearted poem. It's no great shakes as a poem, but it just touches upon what Shaista was saying about rhyme and punning. The dolphins are singing. Fish give us a sufficiency beneath the sea, as you can see. We eat with great efficiency beneath the sea, as you can see. Like other good cetaceans, we scatter good vibrations. We harry herring happily and swallow salmon snappily. Our skins are smooth and rubbery. Our bulky bodies blubbery. We harry herring happily and swallow salmon snappily. With unspecific gravity and sinusoidal suavity, we harry herring happily and swallow salmon snappily. With acrobatic levity and aerobatic brevity, we harry herring happily and swallow salmon snappily. So, <laughs> do you know, Shasta, I don't think I've actually ever read that poem. Well, in the set, or read it out. <laughs> because, of course, it was set to music and other people were singing it. Mm. And uh, it's unusual to be asked to read something like that. Thank you um, uh, for bringing me back to the the world of fish and efficiency. And also rhyme, if you'd like to talk yes, about now rhyme. why you um, rhyme. You notice that the rhyme in, the, in this particular uh, poem was what's known as a triple rhyme. Uh, it's not rhymed on the final syllable, like book and shook, mm. or book and mistook, which is stressed on the last syllable. It's not even stressed on the last but one syllable, which would make it but this form is called, for some reason, I don't know, a masculine rhyme. A feminine rhyme is one which is stressed on an earlier syllable, like 
table and able or fable in table um, and one that stressed even further back like uh, uh, sufficiency and efficiency, efficiency or something like that or uh, uh, levity and brevity where there are two little tails attached that's also feminine rhyme but it's called uh, it's got another t name to it now when I was writing um, a long uh, novel and a novel in verse called The Golden Gate which is actually the first novel I wrote um, my first reaction when I began to um, to think about it was I've never written a novel before in fact I've never even written a short story before how on earth am I going to set about doing it but I had read a a wonderful book um, by Alexander Pushkin the great Russian writer which had been translated very well into English uh, called Eugene Onyegin and in on Eugene Onyegin every stanza has a certain shape it's 14 lines long there are four uh, there are three groups of four lines and one final couplet at the end so that's four plus four plus four plus two but the interesting thing is that the rhyming rhyme scheme is very different the first four lines rhyme A, B, A, B. The second rhyme C, C, D, D. The third is E, F, F, E, like a sandwich, and then you get G, G. And the first rhyme in each quatrain is a feminine rhyme. It has to be a feminine rhyme. That's part of the deal when you write it. But the important thing is when you're writing in this form, it shouldn't sound forced. It shouldn't sound as if, as if uh, the rhyme is thudding in place each time a line ends. And I brought a suitable, uh, sorry, I brought, um, I hope I brought, um, yes, uh, the Golden Gate along. Oh, sorry. You could, you could tell that was going to happen, did you? Could you? Okay, fine. I'm... So, um, everything in the book, including the acknowledgments, are in this 14 line stanza with um, feminine, masculine rhymes. Uh, alternating these are these, these are the acknowledgments my debts are manifold and various where, first Stanford University where with progressively precarious nurture my tardy PhD has waxed and waxes lax and sickly second to friends who read this quickly advised me to desist and cease or burbled what a masterpiece or smoothed my steps with sage suggestion Third, to John and Susan Hughes for refuge, friendship, ears, and views. And fourth, to you, who did not question the crude credentials of this verse, but backed your brashness with your purse. <laughs> so, uh, after the dedication and context, contents also in verse, I'll just read the first stanza. To make a start more swift than weighty, hail muse. Dear reader, once upon a time, say circa 1980, there lived a man, his name was John. Successful in his field, though only 26, respected, lonely, one evening as he walked across Golden Gate Park, the ill-judged toss of a red frisbee almost brained him. He thought, if I died, who'd be sad? Who'd weep? Who'd gloat? Who would be glad? Would anybody? As it pained him, he turned from this dispiriting theme to ruminations less extreme. So that's the style in which the, the whole story is told. And for me, because I was scared of the novel as a form, it was great to have a kind of bridge, something that was both a long poem and a novel, so that I could then feel equally at home on both sides, so to speak, of this divide. Okay. Which is also very interesting because it's called a novel in verse. And I think that it is something, again, which very few uh, 20th century writers, as far as I know, have done. And again, it's this idea of a bridge. And moving on from that image which you've used of the bridge, Yes. Um, how has music shaped your writing? Has it? Most well, well, certainly. Both in terms of, uh, uh, of form, music has uh, shaped my writing, both in terms of, 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 of shape, of form, and I'd say uh, also in terms of, of content. Um, and then, of course, in, in terms of collaboration. In terms of form, well, most poetic forms are intrinsically musical, um, as long as they're not completely um, unscanned and unrhymed. 
um, like free verse, of which I have also written some. Um, secondly, with regard to a book I wrote called An Equal Music, which is a novel, certain passages in it um, have a, a shape that's partly prose and partly poetry. In fact, some entire sections have been written in words of a single syllable. So there are different aspects in which form, a musical form or the sense of words um, affects my writing. In terms of content, um, in terms of content, I would say an equal music, since it's a story of a violinist who fell in love many years previously with a pianist. Um, music pervades the book. But writing about music is, someone said writing about music is like dancing about architecture. <laughs> How do you do it? Um, I'm, happy, I'm happy to take the applause for it, but it's not original with me. Um, it's, it's a good, it's a really interesting thought, isn't it? So what I decided to do was this. Rather than bore the reader and myself with long disquisitions about Haydn or Beethoven or Mozart or Bach, I thought I'd write it in the first person. If you write it in the first person, then if this guy is raving on about something, you'll just think, oh, that's kind of interesting. He's going on about something. You can read it or not, or you can understand it or not, but it's Michael speaking. So it was quite a tactical reason why I decided to set that, write, write, write that book in the first person. But of course, the problem then became the unreliability of the first person. If I'm writing as an omniscient narrator or semi-omniscient in uh, uh, The Golden Gate or A Suitable Boy, I was suddenly faced with inhabiting the skin of this rather complex chap who I didn't, from time to time, I didn't even particularly like. And I had to sort of live in his skin for a couple of years. Um, I sometimes think I, I want to shake him, you know, like, don't you understand it's Julia who's got the problem? Why are you pitying yourself? Still. So that book was entirely about music and as a suitable boy um, had music, both uh, the courtesan, uh, the, the wife, uh, Sayyida by Feroz Abadi, who was a wonderful singer, not only of ghazals, but she'd come to uh, one of her patrons' house, houses and sing around the time of Holi and so on. And then there was also the singer, the great, um, rather disdainful uh, towards other forms of, lesser forms of music, as he called them, Ustad Majid Khan, uh, Sahib, and, and, um, and his uh, Shagird, who, whom he started off on very bad terms with. Now, my own background, my own training, uh, such as it is in, in music, is um, I, I studied under Pandit Amar Nath Ji, and uh, he was my guru, and he himself, his Ustad was, was Ustad Amir Khan Sahib, who, who was one of the great, great uh, singers, and whom I can hardly listen to anything of without being transported. So that's one of the reasons why I can't write to music. When I'm writing, I simply cannot put music on. Um, either I get completely lost in it, or I get irritated by it because it's not very, it's not to my liking. And this um, difficulty I've had with someone who sings Besura goes all the way back <laughs> to when I was about a year and a half old and my, uh, my mother would sing lullabies to me. And I'd say, she had a friend, a, a Bengali friend, Kalyani. Uh, so I'd say, Mama, Mama, tum mat gao. <laughs> <laughs> Kali maashi aegi, Kali maashi ko gaane do. <laughs> so uh, tact was not one of my strong points even then. And obviously what you've just said about music being so important mm. uh, is there in your latest work where you've put together yes. uh, 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 all these different uh, uh, poems to music and you've translated material yeah. uh, and um, obviously this is, it's a coming together of things that you have been doing. That's right. Um, would you, in the same vein, like to tell us a little bit about Orion and the, and the Dolphin? Because that was much earlier. Sure, that's Did right. Did you have this idea that you were going to ultimately shape something in which there would be the, the written word, the human voice, and you would also have musical accompaniment in terms of instruments? Uh, are you talking about Orion and the Dolphin? Orion and yeah. the Dolphin. Yeah, that again, uh, I normally don't take commissions to do anything unless 
it's absolutely fascinating to me. I, I just follow my own muse, so to speak. Um, but in this particular case, um, I, I had heard Alex uh, um, settings of some of my poems to music. Mm -hmm. Now those poems were not written to be set to music, but he had set them, and so I liked his music. And I knew that if I wrote something, it wouldn't be wasted. Uh, the one thing I hate doing is wasting my time. I mean, I like loafing, but I don't like wasting my time on, 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 on serious matters if, if, if they don't <laughs> come, come too much. Um, and I knew that Alex's music would clothe the work in a, in a form that, that really pleased me. Um, and so it did. Um, but I think he chose a good tactical moment as well because I had just returned from a European trip and he'd asked me, what about an opera libretto? He asked me that before I went and I said, well, actually, look, I don't like opera much. Um, I like leader, or uh, songs, songs. Um, but then when I went uh, to, I think I was in Vienna or Venice, I saw two really terrible operas and I thought, my God, this, these words are, are, are crap, I can write better than this. And uh, so I was mentioning that to Alec and he said, well, what about my, my leader? So I said, no, no, I'll write you a libretto. And before I could change my mind, he took me to the English National Opera, got me to sign something, and I was stuck. Uh, I'm going to quote, not as well as you do, but from, from this same libretto, Warm Earth, teach us to nourish, not destroy the souls that give us joy. That, to my mind, looks straight ahead to what you say in your general introduction to in your latest book, which is um, of the beauty of our common planet. Uh, is yes. that something that is a, of concern? Because it seems to me to be a yeah. recurring motif in your work. You, uh, yes, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, it, uh, it is. When I'm writing fiction, of course, even if I have a particular um, enthusiasm or cause, whether it's, uh, you know, um, communal harmony or women's rights or the environment or whatever it ha may happen to be, I can't introduce it unless it's of interest to one of the characters. Otherwise, it seems too dissertational in a sense. You're just, your reader is captive. Well, not so captive. They can put the book down. But um, it just doesn't ring true to the actual narrative. Um, but in something like poetry, where you're basically writing about something that you're moved by or interested by, of course there's nothing to prevent you from, from going on about you know, the beauty of the earth, for instance, if you want to. Um, I wrote a, a set of books called, a set of poems called Beastly Tales from here and there. Now, Beastly Tales, um, was in rhyme um, and meter. Uh, the tales are quite, not, if not immoral, at least amoral, but children seem to love hearing them and getting their parents to read them to them. But the last poem was much longer than the others. It was called The Elephant and the Tragopan. And that is, in a sense, an ecological fable about what was happening in the northeast of India but it could be applied more, more generally uh, uh, in, in some ways. Um, the difficulty of uh, politics, the necessity for man and uh, non-humankind, let's say, to live together, um, and the kind of responsibility that we have for, not just for our particular generation, but for people who... It just begins thus. The Elephant and the Tragopan. In Bingle Valley, broad and green, where neither hut nor field is seen, where bamboo like a distant lawn is gold at dusk and flushed at dawn, where rhododendron forests crown the hills and wander halfway down in scarlet blossom, where each year a dozen shy black bears appear, where a cold river filmed with ice sustains the minor paradise, an elephant and tragopan discussed their fellow creature, man. Basically, they, disco they discovered...
There's um. Sorry, I, 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 <laughs> this is my problem. Once I'm in a particular place, then I just keep wanting to continue in that place. Whereas, well, I think that this is a great privilege that we have that you are actually reading your own work. Anything that I can ask you, actually, well, yeah. it's not going to make all that much difference to our lives. But, but Shasta, what he it's a says, what he has, to, you, simply the sound of the poet's own voice reading his own work, I think gives it that dimension of meaning and you have an insight into it. So I think that this is... Um, in Beastly Tales, you have also taken tales from different parts of the world. Yes. That seems, again, to me to be something that is prompting what comes later in the River Dirt, the way you have uh, organized that. What is your interest in this? And were you aware of wanting to span different aspects or different dimensions of the world? Well, and I languages? mean, here in the subcontinent, or I would say maybe uh, particularly in India, we get, we have something of three great civilizations, which is obviously sort of the Hindu civilization, the Islamic civilization, and you could call it the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. civilization. Now, I didn't know much about the Sino-Tibetan, Japanese, the East Asian civilization. And much later, I read some poems in translation, um, written by an 8th century poet, Dufu. Very, sorry, no, I'd read Wang Wei's poetry, who was a contemporary of Dufu's. Um, and I was very moved by these poems. They talk about nature, for example, but in a different way from um, either the the, the um, Hindi poets or the English, like, like Wordsworth, they did not like Wordsworth or Kalidas or anyone else, a Sanskrit or Hindi poet, um, but in a completely different manner, a sort of more, rather like, um, like Chinese painting with just a few touches here and there, you convey a certain spirit. Um, also, he talked about friendship. Uh, you know, in, in our poetry, uh, passionate love is a, is, a, is a strong theme. But here in, Ch in China, when people were parted for friends for sometimes uh, uh, their whole life, if someone, a civil servant, was posted to Xinjiang and someone was, else was posted to Guizhou, for example, they might never meet again. So there's a lot of quite moving and intimate poetry about friendship. And so I became very interested. And I thought to myself, if I get so much pleasure from these poems in translation, what pleasure would I get from them if I could read the language itself. So that's what led me to that. It wasn't anything schematic in any sense. I was just drawn by one obsession or another. Then later, the only ma way I managed to go to China was I was an economist studying at Stanford. And the only way I managed to get to China was by sort of massaging my economics dissertation into having some sort of Chinese theme. Uh, now, I couldn't very well tell them that seven Chinese villages and economic then the colon, right? Every, every good thesis title has to have a colon. And then there's a kind of post-colonial bit, which went seven Chinese villages, an, an economic and demographic portrait. <laughs> now, after spending four years getting my um, course requirements, then two years in China, then five years back in Stanford, during which time I wrote uh, this travel book about hitchhiking across Tibet back to India, and also the Golden Gate. So it took me 11 years not to get my PhD, uh, which <laughs> is something of a record. I'm afraid I, I've used that joke before, and it, uh, it always draws a slightly rueful laugh. Um, so I'm what they call an ABD, an all but dissertation. Um, but one thing I did learn from being an economist was this that there are things called opportunity costs. And if, for example, I told the muse, look, I have to finish my dissertation, come back with the Golden Gate a year or two later, he or she, or whatever the form the muse takes, would have gone away, and it would have served me right. Um, so one always is not to think whether something is worth doing, but whether there's something better that you could do, even if it's riskier, The other piece of advice I have is this. Um, after I finished writing The Golden Gate, I had just about enough by way of an advance to take myself and my books back to Delhi without a thesis, of course. And I wrote to my 
my parents and I said to them, look, uh, do you think uh, I want to write another novel? I want this to be set in India. I have no idea exactly what it's going to be. It'll be about two or three hundred pages at the most. And uh, it'll, uh, it'll take me a year or two. So do you think you could just, could I come home? So my mother, who actually is quite literary and, and loves literature, she said, no, I don't think we should, uh, she said to my father, I don't think we should do that. You know, <laughs> let the boy take care of himself. What will happen when we are gone? He's got two good degrees in economics from two universities. Let him get a job, then he can indulge his hobby later. Um, and my father said, no, he hasn't cost us much. You know, he's got his scholarships and things. What's, what's the harm? So I went in my 30s to sponge off my parents uh, in Delhi. They had a nice large house. It was, my mother was a judge, so they, she got a kind of official house. Uh, now, of course, we live in a, a smaller place. Um, but at the top floor was, was empty. But all the children came back. My brother, who's a bit of a kind of Buddhist uh, uh, persona, and in fact, he, he's a teacher now. Um, and my, my sister, Radhana, who was uh, studying filmmaking and is a filmmaker, and myself, who's supposed to be earning money, but was probably earning minus several thousand rupees a month. Um, <laughs> But we were all living in, my, in our parents' house as sort of adults. And uh, our uh, driver was totally shocked, you know. He said, uh, he was asked by, uh, by a colleague, what do these people do? And he said, bhai, kya kahe? Um, <laughs> I won't tell you what he said, but at the... <laughs> but at any rate... <laughs> so... So this is what I advise you to do. Robert Frost said, home is the place where if you have to go, they have to let you in. <laughs> yeah. Vikram, would you like to read this and then this? Because it's, okay. I think it would be okay. good. Um, has asked me to read a Dufu poem. A Dufu poem. This was written in the, as I said, the 8th century. Um, and Dufu was a civil servant, actually, or aspired to be a civil servant. He wanted to serve not just the emperor, but the people, in a sense. It was part of the Confucian philosophy. And he took it very hard, because he kept failing these civil service exams. Um, thank God he did, because he, he, he is one of the supreme poets. Although at that time, he was not much recognized as a great poet. At the end of his life, he's wandering down the Yangtze to go back home, after a terrible rebe rebellion which had shattered the empire, uh, he had, was separated from his family. One of his young children died of starvation because of the disruption of supplies. And of course, he, did, he was not to know that many, many uh, generations after his death, and to this very day, he's recognized probably as China's greatest poet. A very moving, slightly self-deprecating, um, wonderful wordsmith at the same time. This is a very feeble attempt to translate an eight-line poem that he wrote. It's called Thoughts While Traveling at Night. And the great river that he refers to is the Yangtze. Light breeze on the fine grass. I stand alone at the mast. Stars lean on the vast wild plain. Moon bobs in the great river's spate. Letters have brought no fame. Office too old to obtain. Drifting, what am I like? A gull between earth and sky. And, yeah. The second is uh, by Ghalib, uh, two years after the mutiny. And it's not a translation of a poem of his. I have translated some Urdu poetry, some fairs and others. But um, in this case, it's a translation, really, or a versification, you might say, of a letter of his. Now, he was a wonderful letter writer. Letter. Some people say that, I mean, really, it's hard to choose. Uh, even if he were, were, were not known as a great poet, his letters itself are so lively, so animated, so humane, uh, so full of interest, that he would be one of the greatest prose writers um, of, of the language. He's writing to a friend, Yusuf Mirza. Dear Yusuf Mirza, none but God can know my plight. Men have gone mad from cares far less than those I fight. 
But grief and cares for what, you ask? What do I claim? For death, for parting, for my livelihood, my name. Whose deaths? I leave aside the stricken Mughal court in Delhi proper, not the inauspicious fort. Your uncle, Ashur Beg, and Mir Nasiruddin, my sister's grandson too, a mere child of 19. Mustafa Khan, his sons, the blood flows from my pen. The names go on. Oh God, what can replace such men? Those of my friends who live, like Miran in Majru, condemned to roam the world, may God preserve them too. My brother died insane, his children and his wife stranded in Jaipur eke their pittance of a life. The children of high lords go begging in the street. My household, God knows how, finds just enough to eat. Nor is my time my own. I have grown, grown old. How can I bear this load? I am no giant, but a man. I leave my sickbed, try to sit an hour or two, to write, to plan, to think, but there's too much to do. As for sustaining wine, my cash won't spill that far, still less to buy a gift if called to the darbar. They used to call me once. Will they do so again? I who have neither helped nor harmed the Englishmen. I'm sending you an ode about my life, which might, sorry, I'm sending you an ode about my life, which night and day for two long months I've sweated blood to write. Say if you think my skill has cheated fortune's knife, even if my heart lacks fire. Why fire, even life? In my old eulogy for Amjad Ali's name, I've slotted Vajid in, but God has done the same. Such verse in praise of kings, just notch it down a peg. I wrote it not to show my prowess, but to beg. More news. That gentle boy, Shivji Ram's son in pride, fell ill, lay two days thus, and on the third day died. His father is distraught with grief, and for my part, I have lost two more friends, one dead, one sick at heart. Another 20 months, and I too will be dust. My body to Rampur, my soul to light, I trust. What grief, joy, praise, or shame afflict me in this spell, I will find strength to face. Goodbye. May all be well. Yes. Actually, um, uh, since I'm on the uh, 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 kind of... No, let's open it to the floor straight away. Yeah. No, no, not yet. Nee? Nee. Could, uh, no, no, it'll come out. It'll come out in the discussion, I'm sure. Let's, because uh, I think uh, time is short. And if the... Yeah, let's just, let's just open it to the floor and be kind of geographically democra demo democratic. Because people at the back feel rather hard done by. Um, I'll tell you what, could you stand up rather than hold up your hand? That way I'll be able to see yes. if... Uh, sure. Go ahead. Um, uh, one, first you, then you, and we'll go on from there. Gentlemen first. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Thank you for that. Um, um, one of the strong motifs... Would you, would you yeah. speak loudly so that I can okay. hear you? One of the strong motifs in your works is uh, brotherhood. Brotherhood. Which is very cosmic to me. It sounds cosmic to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like you to talk a bit about that. Oh dear. Uh, brotherhood. What do I think of brotherhood? I think it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, I would, I would expand it into, into siblinghood, if I might. Uh, because, you know, people talk about... Uh, in the Indian constitution, we, in the preamble, we have uh, uh, justice, um, liberty, equality, and fraternity. But of course, fraternity in Latin means literally brotherhood. Sorority would be sisterhood. Um, and I think now we've got to accept that the term has to, uh, has to and should very rightly include both. Um, quite a few of my um, uh, books of characters, like uh, say Firoz and Imtiaz, who were twins, um, or uh, Pran and Man, who, who are brothers, and so on. So there is quite a lot about those relations, family relations in general. Oh, sorry, say that again? There are a lot of 
pairs and couples in your works. So lots of couples. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's also a good thing. And that's not to say that the, the trios aren't good things, but couples are probably more stable. <laughs> I'm sorry, you had a question. No, the lady there. Yeah, first. Your, your book, Two Lives, which was yes. the autobiographical account, autobiographical account of your a German aunt and your Indian uncle. Sure. I, it was a lot of fun because you, you covered it over a, a number of decades, right, from World War II and their relationship, how it progressed and how your relationship was. Yes. Can you maybe touch a little bit about why you wrote the book and your feelings as you went through what was obviously a treasure trove of antiques and, yeah. and how their relationship, I mean, they hadn't seen each other for so many decades, for such a long time after he was not living with them anymore. Yeah. Could you just touch about what you felt or, or how they felt while you were writing it? Um, I wrote a book, just, just for those of you who don't uh, know the context of this question, called Two Lives. It was my last fat book, so to speak. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was about my great aunt and great uncle. He was Indian, he went to Germany in the 1930s, when of course Hitler was uh, in power or getting to be in power. He met my aunt who was uh, German, in fact a German Jew, um, who, whose father had fought for the country in the First World War, but that didn't help the family much. They were in terrible trouble. She managed to escape one month before the war. They met again in England, they got married. When I went to England as a young student, my parents were a bit unwilling. They thought, you know, um, uh, sex and drugs and rock and roll would be the undoing of me in England. But because Shanti uncle and Auntie Henny were there to keep a kind of admonitory eye on me, so they thought, chalo, tiki hai, bheji So there I went. Um, at one point I found I had to learn a European language to go to university. Now, they always spoke in German to each other. They'd always spoken in German to each other. So at night when I was lying in my room, I could hear them quarreling in German. And occasionally I'd hear something like, ta -da 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 Vicky, or ta -da 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 -da, the boy should, or something. So I knew they were talking about me, but I couldn't understand for the life of me what on earth they were saying. Um, but when I had to learn this language, my aunt said, what you can't change, you've got to accept. You may only have six months, but I'm going to make you learn it. So every time I came home for the holidays, she didn't even let me ask for my food in English. She insisted on it being German, and she being very Germanic, she was very strict. And, uh, and so I learned it in six months, and I passed whatever exam I had to do. And, uh, but the wonderful aspect of this was that I could understand what they were quarreling about. Uh, and I knew what was happening, and also, I became much more part of the family. For my aunt, who had always said, uh, Vicky is, is my husband's nephew. And one, once she began talking to one of her friends, and she said, and of course, you meet, you've met my nephew. And then she paused, and then she just continued. So after that, I was either my husband's nephew or my nephew, it didn't matter. And for uncle, Shanti uncle, they were childless, this couple, I became Zenshin, which means little son. Now, many years passed. I left England. I went to California, China, etc., Avara, somewhere around the world. But I always kept up with my great uncle and great aunt. And when they were ill, I managed to visit them a few times. And uh, then my aunt died at the age of 80. Um, I interviewed my uncle about his life because he had nothing much to do. And my parents said, Why don't you, my mother particularly, why don't you interview him? It'll be good for you. It'll be something interesting for him to do. And I touched upon various subjects. My aunt's life. I really couldn't touch upon the painful subject of what had happened to her family, her mother and her sister who were left behind in Germany. And later I discovered this group of letters in which she'd written to people to find out where they had spent their last days. They were both killed. Um, painful, painful letters to read. And only after my uncle's death was I able to shape this into a book. So in answer to your question, I, I couldn't write it in his lifetime. I tried several times to begin, but I couldn't. The second thing is I talk about quite intimate things. But my feeling is, if it's clear what your general feeling is about someone, then there's no point in, in trying to hide various subjects or not discuss them in the image of a full life, especially since there were no more. Um, so that was, I had qualms about it, but on the other hand, I felt it was right to do it that way. Uh, thank you. I'm quite tempted to repeat what you said in case someone didn't hear it, but it's enough for me that you said it. Thank you. 
2009, Indian people started a battle. You might have to battle. speak. Uh, hold in 2009, Indian people started a battle against a very inhuman clause in Indian Penal Code. Actually, can against. you hear? Can you hear the gentleman at the back? No. Okay. Now. Yeah. Then. In 2009, Indian people started a battle against a very inhuman clause, yeah. in, in, and you supported that. Sure. It was against uh, humanity as a uh, homosexuality as a crime. Yep. This was the first time probably I noticed that you uh, made a political statement. It was political and public engagement as yeah. well. And uh, so what urged you and how do you feel that you also had a role in this victory yeah. because you wrote to the government sure. and why not so many other issues as well? Um, the fact of the matter is I have written about other issues. Um, uh, certainly when it comes to communal harmony, I've been very uh, pretty outspoken about that. Uh, after the destruction of the Babri Masjid, um, we took out, you know, uh, on the front page of the Times of India and other papers, large advertisements which began, actually it was very interesting, we, uh, we just, we, only, we made sure that only Hindus signed that particular petition and we headed it saying, if you are a Hindu, read on. And we said, if you think, if you have thought, I can't, it was phrased very well in my, in my mother's book, uh, on balance, her autobiography, she writes about it. If you think that this has brought uh, increased harmony be, uh, between the communities or uh, increased India's uh, uh, role in the world or in any sense a cause for prize, pride, consider the opposite, that it has increased tension between the uh, um, uh, communities and has brought shame to our country. And we signed it. Several people said, why are you just, you know, putting yourself out like this, especially since my mother was a judge, I two members from the same family, including many other people. Um, so we've talked about subjects like that, for sure. But um, also on Tiananmen, um, but in this particular case, uh, and I suppose the environment, but in this particular case, Section 377, which was part of the, um, uh, the, 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 the criminal code that was handed down to us by the British, um, the section is very interesting. It, it actually refers to male homosexuality, but it was kind of used as a kind of blanket thing to oppress anyone. So even, say, a lesbian couple that was living together would be, you know, the police could be sent, sent in to tear them apart or to, or to disturb their lives, and families were always saying to kids, well, look, even if the law isn't enforced much, it's in the law that what you're doing is sinful and harmful and wrong. Now, in our culture, to talk about sex at all, let alone to talk about gay sex or anything that's uh, whatever, um, sex before marriage or anything like that. Or blasphemy. Blasphemy indeed. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's, that, that's an interesting blanket. and a very complicated question. Yeah. Uh, more on this side of the border than there, but yes. quite a lot even there. Mm. Um, just to get to, to, to the point, if I may, um, I decided, well, actually a friend of mine asked me to sign um, 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 a letter, a general letter, partly to change the climate of opinion. Now, obviously, it was sub judice. There was no way we were going to change the court unless we were attached to it, and you shouldn't. But just to create the general climate of opinion in which a judgment, if it were favorable, would not be looked, up, looked at askance. So I signed it. But having signed it, I thought, well, if I put my name to it, I better make sure it, look, it reads well. Uh, <laughs> everyone's going to think I wrote the damn thing, uh, which wasn't true. Eh? The credit goes to, to Sudhar Dubey. In fact, the real credit, I'd say, goes to those people who fought this case in the courts, uh, in the Delhi High Court. Finally, the Delhi High Court rejected it as being, uh, as being no locus standi. It went to the Supreme Court. It took years to be decided there. It was sent back to the High Court. So really, I mean, it was a big struggle in the face of a lot of um, disillusionment, and they stuck to it. I came in as a sort of Johnny come lately, and having done that, I said I'll also talk, you know, I'd laid my own life open a bit by signing that. I'll happily uh, give interviews if, if required, because people need to know that there's nothing either weird about it or, or less valid about it, and that's, that's my take on the situation. I must tell you one thing, though. Though the Delhi High Court has um, read down that section so that um, it's not a crime um, for, uh, um, as long as it's voluntary. That's the crucial thing. Um, 
the, the ambit of the Delhi High Court's judgment is strictly speaking Delhi. But the influence of it has gone throughout the country because the government isn't going to bring up a case against it. In fact, the government has not opposed the appeal to the Supreme Court, which someone, sorry, has not sided with the people who brought an appeal to the Supreme Court against this decision. Now, if the Supreme Court decides in favor, and it's a very well-written judgment, um, I think, well, then immediately it will become uh, the law of the land. But at the moment, it virtually is, but not, as lawyers would say, sensu stricto. Yes. Let me, let me touch on, touch on uh, the, the fact that um, many religious parties, people um, like various uh, 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 Islamic or Christian or Hindu uh, people agitated, are they are the main people to bring it up to the Supreme Court. In any case where there's a, a conflict be between religion and humanity, there is no doubt in my mind, whether it's women's rights or gay rights or whatever, there is no doubt in my mind as to which should be the Dehla that trumps the Nehla. I have a, a very simple question to ask. How would you differentiate your, uh, you know, how would you define your writing style? Uh, when you are writing prose, of course you have rhyme and uh, rhythm in it. So how do you differentiate poetry and prose? Um, look, Obviously, this is a discussion which, will, which can last several hours. Um, I'll, I'll try to com compress it into uh, a few thoughts. One is this, that um, the kind of poetry, excuse me, uh, the lady in red, could you just, I want to look at the person who's, who asked the question. Um, so, you don't need to stand up, it's okay. I could, uh, yeah. I, at least I can see. Uh, I, I, I used to be painfully shy when I was younger. Um, and. Uh, even when I was talking one-on-one -on -one to someone, I, I, I would keep looking away. Uh, what happened? So, so I find it easier to concentrate on one person and ignore the rest. Uh, um, but I'll give you a, a, a tip. A friend of mine who was not shy at all, an American woman who was in her late 70s, I said to her, Brooke, how come you're so confident in company? And she said, you know, until I was about 40, I was always worried about what people thought about me. And then... After the age of 40, I became much more concerned about what I thought of them. <laughs> so that helped me a lot. A few years later, I said to her, Brooke, you know, this remark of yours made a huge difference to me. She said, did I say that? It sounds very wise. <laughs> so to get to the... Uh, with poetry, you know when it's formed, when, when it clicks, when the stanza is complete, when you don't have to revise it. With prose, there's the possibility of endless revision. You could pull this out and change that without, cha without changing the rhyme and the meter. Here in, in poetry, if I, if I change April to September, if it rhymes, then I've got to find a new rhyme. If it's in the middle, then a three-syllable word has replaced andaz bigar jata na to. So I have to do something to adjust it. Kuch uh, jugar. Uh, so basically, uh, with, with prose is another thing. It has a kind of rhythm, but it shouldn't draw attention to itself too much, I feel, in, in my, my prose. So with those two short thoughts, they're not very satisfactory, I know, as a, a complete answer to it, but uh, that's all I have time for at the moment. The last question, okay. Hello. Um, I wanted to know... Let's, let's make it two. In 2009, you said that we could expect a sequel to A Suitable Boy in 2013. Um, I wanted to know whether we, will it be published next year and how prominently will the Chatterjee family be in it? Um, so which family? Chatterjee? The Chatterjee family. Yeah, yeah the, 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 this um, the book A Suitable Boy had four main families, one of which uh, are the Chatterjees who are uh, uh, a kind of lively Calcutta family. I hope the Chatterjees will be in the sequel. I don't really know. I haven't yet, the muse hasn't consulted me in such detail yet. Lata will certainly be in it, but uh, Lata was 20 at that time. Now she'll be 80 if I write about the, the present. She'll be a crone. I, I wanted to uh, just tell you, Vikram said, sir, my name is Femi Darias. And I have had the pleasure of adopt, adapting your play 
uh, into Urdu, the, the one for children. Oh, Greek, right, you wrote to me, yes. Into, yes. yes. Oh, you wrote to me, I see. Yeah, she, she wrote. Okay. Yeah, but there was, I also read your book, A Suitable Boy. Yeah. And so, uh, you uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, you should see it. Yeah. You should see You became very popular amongst Pakistani yeah. children. Right? Uh -huh. so, a suitable boy. Uh, it so reminded me of Kuratulay uh, and Heather. I couldn't hear you. I'm so sorry. Kuratulay and Heather. Oh, Kuratulay and Heather. Yes, you have it. You are from You are from Uttar Pradesh, are you? <laughs> Are you from Uttar Pradesh? I am, well, really, uh, my mother's side of the family comes from Lucknow Achha. and Sitapur, Biswam, that area. My yes. father's side comes from Old Delhi. Okay. But strangely enough, my mother knows much more about Bengal and my father about Punjab because he was born in Okara, in fact, Okara. Right. before partition. It's because your mother was from Lucknow. Perhaps that's why it so reminded me of uh, Miss Heather, Kuratul and Heather, because yes. she writes about Lucknow. And the kind of households you describe. Right. Um, have you read her works? Akka Darya? Actually, yeah, I've read parts of it, I have to say. I haven't read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I partly was afraid to read um, books or long books when I was writing my own. Yeah. I, I had a, a concern that it might influence too much my writing. Um, so, so to that extent, would you, would you like your book, a suitable boy, to be translated see. into Urdu, published here? उम्मीद है कि हिंदी में तो उसका अनुवाद निकल चुका है. शीर्षक है कोई अच्छा सा लड़का, which is a good title. अब पहले मुझसे कह रहे थे कि इसे एक सुयोग्य वर बुलाया जाए, which is very Sanskritic. अब कौन कहेगा मेरी लड़की के लिए एक सुयोग्य वर वर ढूंढ लो? कोई अच्छा सा लड़का, especially the sa. Is, is good. So I hope it will be translated into Urdu as well. And this is the last one. Excuse me, I've, I've got one last question here. Vikram said, in your book, An Unusual Achha, chale, Music, haan, haan, sure. your knowledge of Western classical music is very apparent. But you have said nothing about it today? I I, come, the second question is, uh, your novel, yeah. this novel, is tender and beautiful. Dare I ask, if your novel is based on some facts or is it mere fiction? Um, are you talking about an equal music? Yes. Um, I, I, I didn't, haven't talked at length about Western music because in a sense I've touched upon it but it hasn't, there hasn't been time really to talk about um, every subject under the sun. However, with regard to an equal music, that's me, isn't it? <laughs> a very unequal music. Um, I, uh, this is a question as to whether the love story in it is based on something that happened to me or whether it's uh, um, invented or created. This comes to, uh, this is the heart of uh, the question of writing. Yes. Does it come, uh, uh, to what extent uh, are you projecting, to what extent what you're writing is an emanation of yourself? I fear this is an unanswerable question. Um, I don't think you can write a love story without having felt love um, and I don't think you could write a story about love and loss without having felt love and loss. But consider that Shakespeare wrote King Lear when he was a comparatively young man of 40. Um, so, and he wrote Macbeth without being a murderer. So one has to uh, borrow, imagine and draw upon one's own heart. Uh, Come up to the stage afterwards and I'll answer your question. But I think this is... May I please take uh, advantage of my position here and request Vikram to read a few lines from George Herbert. Um, I'm not going to start introducing George Herbert but I think that it would be most appropriate. It's ah, yes. Yeah. Um, Herbert is the poet in whose house I, I'm, I'm living in, 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 in England. 
He was a contemporary of Shakespeare's and uh, he's a wonderfully calm poet. He's actually an, he was an Anglican priest and though I come from a completely different religious tradition and in fact I can't claim to be very religious either, I've always loved Herbert's poetry. It's very quiet, very sincere, uh, very moving and it's not, well unlike Dunn who's always trying to sort of show off his learning a bit, Herbert never does and so he's writing about the loss of friends and how he's been struck down by so many afflictions. Quite often when I'm in that house I think of his poetry and can hardly imagine that lines as beautiful as these have been written in the rooms that I happen that to inhabit. inhabit. So here we are, he's talking, he's addressing God and he says, after all these uh, sorrows and the loss of friends, suddenly I find, he says, and now in age, having grown old, and now in age I bud again. After so many deaths, I live and write. I once more smell the dew and rain and relish versing. Oh, my only light, it cannot be that I am he on whom thy tempests fell all night. Thank you very much. Vikram said, thank you very much for a riveting session and thank you Shaista Sirajuddin. <clears throat> uh, if you'd like copies of your book signed, please uh, could you go to the book fair area uh, where we, Mr. Vikram said will be signing copies of his book. <clears throat> Here we will be now starting another session on textbooks. So those of you interested in textbooks, please remain seated.